Good evening. We're commencing our Wednesday evening Bible study for this week. So let's please bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? Loving Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us, your watchfulness over us, Lord. Thank you that all our cares are met in Jesus Christ. Give us the grace, Lord God, as we continue in your word, that we seek with all our heart to understand it, to gain our strength from it, and to apply our hearts to it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're into Galatians chapter 3, continuing our studies over here. And tonight we're looking at verses 19 through 25. So if you get your Bible open, Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. The subject tonight is the purpose of the law. So Galatians 3, 19 through 25, the purpose of the law. Okay, please follow with me in your Bible. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which should could have which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Let's please bow for prayer again. Loving Father, we do thank you again for your word, for its reading. We do pray, Lord, now through your Holy Spirit. This passage might not be clarified only, but also, Lord, understood, so we apply it in our lives. We thank you for the goodness that Christ has given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the purpose of the law. Now, for too many people, though I think they have a wrong understanding of the law. To some, it's a way of earning righteousness. And this was the error of the Jews in the Old Testament. To others, it was simply uh, some uh, religious rules that a person is supposed to do to make the church happy. And for others, in instead, they might say, well, it's, the Bible says it's holy, just, and good. Therefore, it is the way of holiness. Now, I suppose if you stop and think, all these different uh, thoughts have a, a bit of truth to them. If uh, a man could keep the law perfectly, sure, he'd earn righteousness, but he can't. But then again, the law does dictate rules on how we should live our life, but as an unsaved person, no way at all can they do that. And the law is revealed from God, holy, just, and good, but still, for an unsaved person, they end in failure all the time. So the conclusion is a man can't keep the law without sinning. That is a fact of life. You've proved it, I've proved it. You can't do it without sinning. Now, the law is a set of rules for true believers to understand how to live their lives in harmony with God, not to earn merit of righteousness. Now, the law was given on Mount Sinai when Israel, when they were redeemed out of Egypt, baptized in the Red Sea, instructed Mount Sinai, was given to him because God said, I'm going to dwell with you now. Be ye holy as I am holy. They're already covered by the blood in, on, the, on the Passover. Now, instruction, if you're going to be with me, this is how you live your life. So for those people who have already come to Christ and received the Saviour to live their lives with him in holiness, God has given us his law. Now these law, the Bible says, is written in our hearts. Why? This is what we want to do now with a new divine nature, not something we have to do. We want to do it, why? To stay close to our Saviour, not to earn merits with Him. We find also <clears throat> the law was never, ever, ever given to show a sinner how to live like a saint. It was never done that, nowhere in the world. Now, God's purpose for, for God, for the law, was never a substitute for faith in Christ. It wasn't an Old Testament, ver Testament version of getting saved. No way in the world. Old Testament, New Testament, salvation is by faith alone, through God's promise alone. 
Now, if we stop and think about the uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 18, just a brief summary, verse 1 to 5 says, The law could not give us the Holy Spirit. Second thing mentioned, 6 to 9, The law can't make us justified. Abraham justified by faith without the, without the deeds of the law. In verse 10 to 12, the law only brings a curse because cursed is upon every single person who does not keep the commandments of God. In verse 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the law, from the judgment of the law. And in verse 15 and 18, we can receive the promise in Christ by faith alone. So this is where we've come to so far in chapter 3. Now we go through a little bit further. The question asks now, if the law is necessary for salvation, then why did it come? Why? What is the purpose of the law? That is the subject of this section tonight. And we'll look at four different points. First thing, we'll look at the character of the law. Then the conflict the law seems to present. Then we'll look at the content or message of the law. Finally, there's two analogies to help us understand the law. Then we'll come to our conclusion. Now, in these simple statements, I won't belabor them. Just very brief, this is Wednesday evening, by the way, not Sunday morning, so I'm not going to go on for a long message, but there's brief points that can be, elab be elaborated upon later. All right. Looking first at the character of the law, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says it was added because of transgressions. Now, man, in a time of conscience, he, he knew about sin, and, about, about, good, about sin and evil, good, good and evil, from the time when Adam and Eve constantly to do what was wrong. Absolutely, the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. So what we have after this is God establishes a covenant with Moses, says, right, I want to tell him plainly, black and white, what I want, what I don't want, what is right, what is wrong. So it came because of man's transgressions. Now, three purposes over here. First, it was given to restrain the practice of sin. You see, when people have the excuse saying, oh, I didn't know it was wrong, then comes the law. Oh, I can see now. Romans 7, 7, yeah, Paul said, I had not known sin, but by the law. Now, Jesus Christ said, anyone who looks upon a woman and lusts after her has sinned already his heart. I would have known that if I didn't read it. I would have thought, commit the outward act, that's the sin. Think about it, no. I mean, if I think about it, I haven't sinned until I've done it. Christ said, no, 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 no. If you're thinking about it, you've done it already. All, all lacks is opportunity. And then you have also in uh, James 4, 4 17, uh, the, the sin of omission, therefore to him that uh, knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, would you have known that in not doing good, you're doing evil? Huh? Would, if, um, would, if, you, if no one told you, if you thought, okay, here's a good Samaritan, and, uh, or this, sorry, the Levite and the priest, they see someone falling down, I, I didn't cause that, not my problem, I'll keep on going. They sinned. Why? Because they knew to do good and didn't do it. Now, unless the law says, you don't, don't do that, we wouldn't know. So the law came to alert us thinking, hold on, this is right, that's wrong. Now in Romans chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, Verse 13 says in the last part, sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The reason why the commandment came is to expose sin and make it real sinful. Now to many of us, sin is just going to be a mistake. Oh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. God said, no, 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 no. You rebelled against me with your heart. That is an act of sin. Now wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. I just simply didn't believe. I mean, I need more proof. Sure, until you did need more proof, you're calling me a liar. Whoa. So basically we find the law was given. Why? Because we have transgressions and it make us know what our sins are. And the end result is that maybe we might want to repent from those sins. Why? Because we still have something called a conscience. Holy Spirit still convicts us. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. What he's saying here is, for you people who are obeying God's word, the law is good. A Christian obeying God's word, man, it's good. 
just, righteous, lovely. I love God's word. Why? It's my meditation day and night. Why? Because he's a saved person. But, verse 9, knowing this, that law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, for murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for lies, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So the law is given to those people who don't hold to sound doctrine. Could be through ignorance, or it may be, but still it's law given to them. So we find, regarding the character of the law, it was given because mankind are sinners and it's to wake them up to their sin. Also, it was temporary. He said uh, it, was, it was added because of trans transgressions till, till the seed should come, till Christ should come. It was there till Christ would come and fulfill the law and pay for the price of our sins upon the cross and rise again and offer a power and peace to all who receive in him. So it was only temporary. The law was temporary till Jesus Christ had fulfilled the promise of the law completely. And also, it was inferior to the promise because the law came through mediators. There's the angels from them come to Moses from most of the people. But the promise went for directly from God to Abraham, no mediator, which shows that the, the promise of life from God to Abraham was far superior than, that, the, than the, um, the covenant of the law. The covenant of the law was a temporary covenant given till Christ would come and pay for our sins completely. Now, more upon this in a few moments' time. Second thing, we have the conflict of the law. The question is posed, if, is there a conflict between the law, Mosaic covenant, and the promise by faith, Abrahamic covenant? Is there a conflict between the two? The answer is, God forbid. May, genoito, may it never happen. Both the promise and the law come from God, not from man. Secondly, they are given for different purposes. See, these two things are beautiful covenants, but each with a different purpose. Then mentions over here, the purpose of the law was not given to give life. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, now we'll be referring to the book of Romans uh, in tonight, because it complements Galatians. <clears throat> In Galatians, so Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 4, There is therefore now no condemnation or sentencing or judgment to them which are in Christ Jesus. And who are they? Who walk not after the flesh or after the law, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Now law of the Spirit of life is the promise given by Abraham, given to Abraham, the law of sin of death, this is the uh, law given to Moses. For what the law, the law of Moses, could not do, in what way? In that it was weak through the flesh. The law was perfect, but it couldn't make sinners obedient to it. It couldn't force sinners to obey it. It couldn't do it. No matter how perfect the law was, it couldn't make a sinner obey it. So God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, Condemn sin in the flesh. In verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And who's the us? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So who we told very, very plainly, the purpose of the law could not give life. If the law could give life, verily God's law could have, but it couldn't give life. Secondly, the purpose of the law was not to gain righteousness. This is the mistake that the Jews failed. In Romans chapter 9, Verse 30 to 33. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Now, here we find a, a, a bit of irony. Gentiles don't have the Old Testament, don't have the law and the covenant, don't have all the prophets, don't have all these things. Yet these Gentiles have found righteousness, satisfying God. H how do they do that? Oh, by their faith in the one who procured righteousness, 
Jesus Christ. But then we have the Jewish people, have the law, have the covenants, have the priesthood, have the prophets, have everything possible. Yet they couldn't find righteousness. Why? Because they sought righteousness through the doing of the law. That's the stumbling stone where they fell. So we're told here the law was never given to make a person righteous. See, righteousness was that, that God approves of is what is imputed to us. Now, back in uh, Romans 4, verses 5 to 8, But to him that worketh not, he doesn't seek to earn righteous by the law, but believeth on him, on Jesus Christ, that justifieth the ungodly, then his faith, the faith of the sinner, is counted or accepted for righteousness. The faith of the sinner is accepted in part of doing works of righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. This blessedness comes upon faith in Christ, not upon works for Christ. This is a beautiful statement over here that complements the teachings of uh, Galatians that we gain position with God by faith in Christ, not on our own efforts. Now we have also the content of the message. Very, very simply, the scripture hath concluded all under sin. The content or the message of the, of the law is simply this. We are all prisoners to sin. Now the uh, Greek word hath concluded Soon Cleo, uh, according to Strong's Concordance, it uh, means to catch as a fish hemmed in a net, to confine, to imprison, to lock up. Now it occurs four times in the New Testament. In Luke 5, 6, the translated enclosed, where the disciples enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Romans eleven thirty two, 32, God hath concluded them all in unbelief. God hath concluded the whole world locked up in prison in unbelief. Galatians 3, verse 23, uh, we were shut up or imprisoned under death. And here in verse 22, the scriptures have concluded or have regarded imprisoned all under sin. So we find over here, the message of the law is this. We are all imprisoned by sin. We have a sinful nature. We can't break free. If you think otherwise, I encourage you to read Romans chapter 7, verse 14 to the end of the chapter. If that doesn't convince you, Nothing will. <clears throat> we are all under sin. You try and tell you, I'll tell you something, here's a little test. Tell yourself, tomorrow I will not sin. Tell yourself that. And then count how many times you do sin, if you can have enough piece of paper to write down all those numbers. Just tell yourself, tomorrow I will not sin. And see what happens. <clears throat> You'll find that, hold on, we have a sinful nature. And that sinful nature is going to stay there. It's going to fight us tooth and nail to the very, very, very end. And the law hath concluded, we're all sinners. Why? We all need repentance. What purpose? Because we all need to come to Christ for salvation. So the law is God's <laughs> light upon our lives so we can see our sin and run to the sinless one for salvation. Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 9 to 12. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles they are all under sin, as is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Verses 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith is said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Then the famous verse 3, 323, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, this is the message of the law. It's not a pretty one, is it? It doesn't say, oh, you know, you're not so bad. You're doing your very, very best. And I'm sure if you try hard enough, God will accept that. God's going to weigh the good, the good with the, the, the bad part of your life. And if you see a lot of good, then you'll pass the test. That's not the message of the law. It never has been. The law isn't, oh, well, if we just simply uh, go and, and memorize the word of God and meditate and read our Bibles through and give our tithes. And, just like the Pharisees. 
and, and dress nice and speak nice and act nice on the outside and make sure the outside is perfect, then everything is fine. No. The law is not something that can take away our history of sins, our record of sins. I can't do that. The best the law can do is try and clean up our act as we live our life. But it can't take away sins and the damage of sin. And very, very plainly in uh, Galatians 3 verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And you fail one time, Galatians 2.10, uh, uh, James 2.10 says, and you're guilty of all. Break one law, you're guilty of all. So who can abide by the stringent condition of the law? Nobody. So try and turn the law for your salvation, it won't work. But the promise of life can count, come through Jesus Christ simply by believing in him. Him, son of God, and his work, he died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried, rose again, and his work was accepted by God the Father. Now, last point over here. We have two analogies of the law given in verse 20 to 25, just to cement what's just been said a few moments ago. First thing, is, first thing in verse 23, the law is likened to a prison. It says, before faith came. Now, here we have Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Before he came, the object of our faith, before he came and died on the cross for us, the war kept under the law, the word kept under is a Greek word means to be kept under guard, to be in protective custody. Like you're taken prisoner and a police, someone's going to put you in prison under protective custody. You're protected over here, others want to get you, I'm protecting you over here. So the law kept the person protective under itself. What for? Well, it taught you all the right things saying, don't go into idolatry. Don't make these evil neighbours your friends. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. And try to protect them. Hem them in. And it kept them in by this protection, these laws and these rules. Then it says also, they were shut up unto faith. They were kept in this prison till the coming of Jesus Christ. And when Christ would come, that's when he would break those bars. We'd no longer be under the protective custody of the law. Also, it mentions the law is like a tutor. In the King James Version, we have verse 24, the law is our schoolmaster. Now, today, a schoolmaster is someone like the headmaster of a high school or something. It wasn't that. In the time of the um, uh, Greek writers, the schoolmaster, the Greek word paedagogos, means simply a tutor, a slave, and his job was to take care of a son, and that son, probably from noble house or from royalty or something, and he'd take him from the age 6 to 16, roughly. In those years, he would raise up that child and teach him what to avoid in life and the dangers of life and <laughs> discipline if he failed. And secondly, teach him the moral teachings and instruct him so he'd grow up with understanding. So he'd get the knowledge he needs through his, his studies and he'd get the <laughs> lessons of life he needs through the stringent regulations. Can't do this, can't do that. Can't go there, can't go here. Dress this way, dress that way. Speak this way, speak this way. Keep your eyes this way, not that way. So all this instruction was given to them by this tutor. Because if you're going to be in the, let's say, royal palace, you need to know how to act and behave. Walk and talk, sit, stand, eat. Whatever it's going to be, you need to know how to behave properly. So this schoolmaster, he was going to teach him from the age six of the 16. So what happens when he became after 16? Oh, let him go. He's no longer under that tutor. Why? He's matured. He's come to age. And the teaching is this. A sinner who is yet without Christ is under the tutorship of the law. Till the time he comes to know Christ as Savior, then he's free. He's come of age. He's outside the tutorship of the law. The law is not there to tell him anymore, you're a sinner on your way to hell. Sorry. Oh, you're a person who should uh, uh, trust Christ as Saviour. I've already done it. I've already done it. So what the law is going to teach me, I've done already. In uh, Romans 6.14, the Bible says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, speaking of believers, for you are not under law, but under grace. We're not under the protective custody of the law anymore. We're not under its purpose anymore. We fulfilled its purpose by coming to Christ. Just like John the Baptist would come and preach to people, repent and be baptized. Why? 
because one mighty than I is coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with power. So repent and be baptized. So they come along and they repent. They get baptized. Now when they come to Christ, forget John. John said, he must increase, I must decrease. The same thing. We come to the law. And the law is our preparation for Christ. It helps us understand we need Christ. So when we come to the law and understand its purpose, we are sinners. We're on our way to hell. We can't save ourselves. Only Christ can. And we come to him. Then great, the law's finished. Now tell me, do you want to hear the gospel again, 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 if you trust the Christ as Saviour? No. Why? I've already accepted it. Do I need to hear it again? No. Should I pray to Christ again? No. Why? I've already accepted it. Exactly. So now, the, the message of the gospel to those who have believed is finished. Give to somebody else now, because you've already received it. And the message of the law. If you've embraced that message and come to Christ as Saviour by faith, then, the, then you're not, no longer under that law anymore. You're free from that law. Why? Because it's done its job. You've been a child. You've grown up now. You've learned everything you're supposed to learn. You've graduated. So when you finish high school, say goodbye high school. You finished uni, bye-bye uni, I'm not going back there again. Why? I've finished, I've graduated, I've done. So we graduate from the law when we receive Christ as Saviour. And that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. It does not mean we don't follow the principles. A saved person, the Bible says, has the law of God in his heart. We have his divine nature and now we follow God's law because we want to. Like David said, man, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the sin of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his Lord does he meditate day and night. Now, you delight in God's word. It's your spiritual food. You enjoy it, and man, you relish it. You, you think, Lord, why can't I obey you more in life? Why can't I do more for you in life? That's your only burden. That's your only burden. Our only burden is, Lord, I don't want to do these sins anymore. I want to be free from them. I want to please you more and more. Please, Lord, give me the grace. Because you see, the law has done its job. It's led you to Christ. And now Christ has taken over. He's done what the law could not do. He's redeemed you. You received imputed righteousness from God himself. You're now a child of God, absolutely perfect in the eyes of God. More about that next week. Let's please bow for prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, for the wonderful salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the law holy, just and good and righteous, given to us by you. Be ye holy for I am holy. There's nothing wrong with your word one little bit, Lord. The problem is that we have a sinful, rebellious nature. We don't want to be told what to do by anybody. Give us the grace, Lord God, for those who listen to this message might not be saved, to be humbled, to turn from their wicked ways and receive Christ. And we are Christians to be reminded, Lord, that this sinful nature in us still wants to rebel against you. And we should again be crucified in Christ and deny the power of the flesh and walk in the Spirit for the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless.